it tells me recording in progress as I was about to say the recordings in progress. Okay. All right. So group study. This is a little bit different than what we do on Tuesday. Tuesday is my podcast. So pretty much just talking about earnest stuff. But group study isn't isn't really well, it doesn't necessarily have to be that dynamic. Or it is very dynamic, but it's not the same dynamic as Tuesday. It's not the same format as Tuesday. So group study, I mean, I have a couple things I could talk about where I am with my practice, things that I'm doing with my own practice, because I'm doing it. So of course I can talk about it. But any anybody else, does anybody have any questions, comments, concerns, things you'd like to talk about? Any difficulty with your practice? I remember, so last Wednesday, I remember we were kind of talking about, I remember we got into Gene and the doorknob and you know, we, I remember Carly's question over the week was about points of attention. I remember she said, if she doesn't establish a point of attention early in the morning, then trying to establish it throughout the day starts to feel like work. And that is the principle of momentum. So if I wake up and I don't firmly establish my practice right away, something else is gaining momentum right? So we're, accum we're moving. Everything is always moving. So it's always accumulating some sort of momentum in some sort of direction. Now that direction, the way that we're talking about it can be very binary, meaning that it's either moving in a direction that has been chosen deliberately, intentionally, and willfully with a deliberate mind and chosen attention, or it's just on autopilot. And that is the habit and conditioning of your entire life experience expressing itself, right? And that can be a little bit tricky if you're trying to, you know, oscillate from one to the other halfway through the day. So I think the lesson in that is to be darn sure that we check into our practice pretty much the moment that we wake up. But if we don't, and later we're attempting to establish our practice. So that's that's kind of what I could go into. And I'll, anybody has any questions? Because I love to answer questions about your practice, about anything that you're doing. Yes, Gene, go ahead, please. Yes, the, uh, the self-dialogue that you talked about last time when establishing the point of attention, um, I, I thought I heard you say that um, uh, talking to yourself about what it is that you're doing can be helpful at, uh, because I'm looking for techniques that are going to help me maintain my point of attention since I find it, it often slips away. So uh, internal self-dialogue was something I was trying to do and it helped a bit, but, but still um, not sufficient to keep me connected all day with my point of attention. Um, you had mentioned that um, we have the point of attention. We might use self-dialogue to say, hmm, I'm using the back of my brain because that's gonna help me look behind me and it, it increases, it, 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 it modifies my posture in such a way that I feel comfortable. All those things happen to be true and I do say those things. Um, but here's my question. My question is, so I've done that and now I'm aware of that point of attention. And then I go about my life. Is that point of attention still with me? Am I still aware of it? And I'm still paying attention to it while I'm doing anything else that I'm doing? Or, or am I stuck in binary? Because that's what it feels like. It feels like I'm doing my point of attention and I'm not doing anything else. And then when I go to do something else, the point of attention disappears again. Yeah. So I don't know if that's a question, but it's an observation anyway. For sure. Yeah. And I think it may not have been posed exactly as a question, but I can see the underlining, you know, curiosity. Like, so I think an important point to clarify, though, holding a point of attention, there's no single technique that will make that happen better or worse. So the technique that we call a, a point of attention, a trick of attention, it will have power if it's not a habit. So if it's not something that the mind is conditioned or used to doing, 
it can be a deliberate point of attention. That's what gives it the validity of a tool, you know, of a technique that we use. If you are choosing something, you know, that is habitual or your mind is already used to looking that direction, it, it starts to get a little bit wishy-washy. It's not quite as clear. It could still be deliberate for a moment, but it's it's just not quite as clear to talk about. So, so that's the first thing. And then the second thing is when we talk about holding a point of attention, so there's no single technique or one technique that's going to make that more accessible than any other technique. Holding a point of attention is a result of pretty much just one thing, and that's the accumulation of the practice, doing it. So the more that you do it, you know, the easier it starts to get, the more you're maintaining a point of attention and forgetting a little bit less. And then before you know it, you're holding something pretty much all day, right? Assuming, and this is what we left on yesterday or last week, assuming that we're not leaking power because that changes the dynamic. So if at any point we start to get down on ourselves, we're losing the momentum that we were gaining. Otherwise, so if Gene says, I'm gonna run 20 miles today and he doesn't run 20 miles, he didn't really lose any power, right? I'm talking personal power, intention and will. Now he didn't really lose anything just because he didn't go run. He didn't necessarily gain it either because the intention was to run and he didn't. And, but that's okay. That doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to leak power or, you know, lose that energy. I'm putting that in air quotes, lose the energy. It's not flowing as smoothly because it's not a matter of accumulation. I don't look at, at energy that way. It's flowing smoothly and then there's flow and, and all the things we're looking for or it's not. And if it's not, that's because the mind is interfering. But when you have a goal to run and you don't, and you start to tell yourself, oh, I should have, this is my problem, I'm gonna, I I'll start doing it next week or something like that, that's when we start to lose the momentum that we had accumulated from holding the points of attention. The we lose all momentum when we start to get down on ourselves. And just to be clear, we're gaining a momentum. It's just a momentum in the opposite direction. It's not the momentum we're looking to gain. So we're always gaining a momentum. It's either going to be in a direction that we would want and that will benefit us, or it will start to slip back. So if there's no leaking power and we're doing our practice and we're maintaining mindfulness, because remember mindfulness, we're not judging. So you're looking at your thoughts, you're not judging. You're looking at your emotion, it's there. Maybe you're sad, maybe you're offended. It's there, we're not going to judge it. That's mindfulness, emotional mindfulness. So if we are maintaining that mindfulness, the accumulation principle will take effect. It will be valid. We'll just continue to accumulate momentum. Specifically though, Gene, I think one thing, yes, the voice of power, talking to yourself, I do it. I'll tell myself like, which mode am I in? Okay, now I'm sitting, where's my golden line? Okay, that's there, you know, where are my elbows? I don't, I don't want my shoulders to be up here. So where are my elbows? These are my points of attention. Am I looking into parts of my mind, the mind gazing? Where's my tricks of attention? I'll, I'll say that to myself. You know, that's a, that's a conversation I'm having with myself to help my practice and help establish it. Now we have an equation called P1 and it could be plus, it could be multiplied. I don't remember at this point, but P1, I think it's times P2, right? Or is it, it's times, it's plus, who knows? <laughs> it doesn't matter. So we have an internal point of attention. There's a reason I, I put that as first. So if I'm sitting in a room and I'm using this cup as a trick of attention, that's fine. But Gene's talking about, well, what, what about when I get up? What about when I start doing things? Well, I, I might not necessarily take that cup with me. You know, I might not be able to navigate with that with that cup. So I have found it to be beneficial. In T, I would just say I have found it to be beneficial, but you can do what you want. In hydrostasy, I would because hydrostasy is a system that is going to be this is what I want you to do. You don't have to do it. You could go do ninjutsu if you want to. You can go follow 
you know, such and such and so and so and, and do whatever. I don't care. But I am going to offer something and it's it's finished, it's ready, it's deliverable. But in that system, I would be a little bit more direct and 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 tell you, okay, let's start with that internal point of attention because that goes with you everywhere. Your body goes where you go. And it can be a little bit easier to maintain a little bit of, like Donna said, feet awareness while doing everything else because your feet are going with you. And that will also fall into the four modes. So you mentioned, Gene, that you're in a room, you're establishing and connecting to a point of attention. It sounds like your mode changes though. Like you go from maybe standing or sitting to moving. Well, that's a part of the that's a part of the practice to pay attention to the transition of going from sitting to standing, from standing to moving. You can say, okay, now that I'm moving, this is my point of attention. Now that I'm standing, this is my point of attention. Now that I'm sitting, this is my point of attention. And you can kind of alternate between the different modes. You can also maintain a similar point of attention in all four modes. Say Dantien, or not Dantien, because that one can be a little bit, seems esoteric sometimes, you know, because it's not, you know, but you could do your hands. You know, you could put a watch on, objects of power. You can take that with you. You know, you can have something in your hand that's a little bit heavy, and that's just reminding you of your practice because that heaviness in your hand is tactile touch. So that is a point of attention. A little bit of pressure too, because the, the weight is creating pressure on your skin. And that's why you feel the weight, the smoothness of the, or the roughness of the object in your hand. That's a little bit more tactile. Does that make sense, Gene? Yeah, I, I like the idea of when my mode changes, it, it, becomes an opportunity for me to to review and check my point of attention again just the the act of changing modes brings me back to the point of attention or another point of attention it it's a deliberate place yeah right and then it's also really important that holding a point of attention isn't a goal and it's not going to become a cognitive trap because it is just a result it's just something that happens you know, before you know it, you start to remember a little bit more than you forget. And then eventually you're able to just feel into your body, feel into the space in the room around you. And you can pretty much just hold that all through the day. And then oscillating through other points of attention as you see fit. When I'm on the train, sometimes I'm looking at reflections. Sometimes I'm listening to different sounds. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, I, yeah, it does. It's just that um, at this point, um, it's it's a it, I has I have made I have made it a goal. It has mm -hmm. been a goal, and when I remember that I lost my point of attention, that's when I lose power apparently because that's when I go again. I lost it again. <laughs> it was only ten minutes ago. Huh? How did I lose it already? So mm -hmm. I guess that's a, a, a leaking power. Um, it is. Yeah. But so then, I just have to observe the fact that I remembered and continue. Yeah. We could call that the Donna principle. Because if, you know, if I'm reading Donna's mind correctly right now, is she still here? I can't see her, her box. But yes. if I were reading, reading Donna's mind correctly, she would say that the moment you remember, you have come back to your practice. Or the moment that you remember, you have forgotten you have come back to your practice. That's a victory more so than a, oh, damn, I forgot. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of flip the script on the way that you're talking to yourself too. You know, two, three years ago, there was no mindfulness practice. You know, there was nothing that we could really do, or there was, but we just weren't doing it, you know? So again, that's another victory. You know, here we are, we're doing our practice. It's, it's coming along. So we have what Gene is describing, which is, you know, we're, we're learning to maintain a point of attention even when things are okay, even when things are fine. We're just, we're going to do it all the time. That's kind of what we're committed to. But it's still really important to remember the redirection approach. So the redirection techniques, redirection of thought due to cognitive attention, 
So we're learning to pay attention to our thoughts. When they don't serve us, we must redirect. And that's not control. That's not manipulating. That's choosing the direction that we want our minds to go. Because very seldomly will a person sit there and choose self-deprecation or, you know, beating themselves up if it's a, an act of choice. But yes, Ida, I would, I would agree. This, this practice really has no goals per se, because you're either paying attention to the present moment deliberately or you're not. If you are, it will accumulate and will start to have the effect. But if we make it a goal, especially too soon, it, it, it could start to feel like work. It could start to feel difficult. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, if I, I, I find if I don't do the, oh, um, um, I was wanting to talk there, but I couldn't unmute myself. Um, okay. I find that if I um, set myself up to do things that I then don't do, my trick now, instead of going into um, Lincoln Power, is to pretend that I deliberately cho choose to do that. Like say yesterday I had planned to walk and I didn't walk. I just say to myself, if that thought comes into my head, that's what I chose. I chose not to walk what, because somewhere along the line I did choose that. But instead of beating myself up and going into the there, there I go again, 20 minute walk every day and I didn't do it. I failed. Instead of going into that, I just pretend, either I pretend that I've already done it so that my mind shuts up or I say to myself, that's what I chose. I chose not to do it. So it was deliberate. And then there's a power in that. Sometimes I just pretend. <laughs> and that works. Fine with me. So we could also look at that as, you know, in the beginning with our voice of power, we're, we're using functional, you know, self-talk like that. You know, I probably wouldn't say exactly that, Ida, but that's okay. We're different people. And like you said, that's working for you. And so as far as T's concern, you know, transcendental embodiment approach, what we named it, you know, four or five years ago or whatever, that's fine. You know, I think, I think if that's working for you, that's great. Sometimes the voice of power, when you have created space in your mind, when you're not filling it with repetitive habitual streams of thought or, you know, these little attempts to control and manipulate and the energy is flowing, you get this feeling and then it is almost instantly translated into words because that's what our mind does. We want to translate everything into this feels good, this feels bad, oh, you know, this is some sort of aha but I had one of those moments not too long ago, and I think this is a popular subject where we want to do something. Maybe it's the dishes. You know, maybe we want to go do that run. Maybe we want to do that exercise that we've been thinking about, whatever it is. And then, you know, we don't. <laughs> For whatever reason, you know, we've accumulated things in the opposite direction, and, and, you know, one reason or another, we just don't do it. I had this mantra surface and it was, Ernest, you can do everything in this world that you want to do, but you can't do it all at once. And that thought occurred to me first as a feeling and then it was translated as a thought, but that has power. You know, that reminds me of a dynamic. I can't do everything at the same time, right? I can't do everything in one 24 hour period because we're creative we're we're the type of beings that you know this group specifically probably that we just we we have so many things that we want to do so many things that we want to create so many things that we want to experience and we can experience it all but sometimes remember this phrase the mind gets on this erroneous time scale it's really weird how the mind creates this really tiny little space that we're supposed to figure everything out and do everything in and that's just not very, very realistic. Does that make sense, Ida? So I, I love the, the mantra that you're using. I, I, don't, I don't know if that would work for me personally, but it might work for Gene, you know, and that's the power of the group study. So maybe he would be like, okay, you know, I'm just going to tell myself something. And, but then again, Gene might say, well, that's not completely accurate. So maybe I wouldn't say that. 
but you know, maybe somebody else would. Maybe Jerry likes that idea. Well, maybe um, what I was thinking was whether I did it or not yesterday, it doesn't matter now. <clears throat> so rather than think that I didn't do it, whatever it was, and take that into today, I just pretend that I did do it because it was yesterday and it was gone. So what difference does it make? The only difference it yeah. makes is for me in this present moment, feeling uh -huh. bad, putting a thought into my head about uh -huh. doing something that is gone anyway, yesterday's history. Uh -huh. So I'd rather feel good about it. And like yesterday I went out for lunch with a friend and we were away a long time and it was really raining extremely heavy and I had put off my morning walk to go in the afternoon and it was really chucking it down, really, really raining hard. And I came home and the fire was lit and it was just so nice. And I thought, no, I'm not going today. But I kind of decided I'm not going today. But then there's that thought, you were walking 20 minutes every day. You were walking two miles every day. You were, you, you know, you didn't do it. But then I thought, right, well, I chose that. I chose to sit at the fire instead on a wet day. And... By putting my power into choosing, believing that I chose to sit at the fire, it was more enjoyable than beating myself up for not going on my wall. Yep, there you go. Because it's the beating yourself up for not going is a habit. That's the habit. And then, you know, we do, and this, this will come with the emotional mindfulness, the behavioral mindfulness, where you're, you're watching your own behavior I would talk myself out of things and I, I can't ignore that, you know? So if I had something I wanted to do, you know, I got nicknamed the back out King because I would make plans and then I would back out because I did, at the, when the time came, I didn't really want to do it. Or did I, when the time came, what was really occurring in my mind? Typically I was talking to myself saying, Oh, I don't really want to go. You don't have to. And then when I didn't do that, and then I just did what I had planned to do, I had fun. I enjoyed myself. And I'm always like, oh, I'm glad I went. So, you know, and this is still something that I'm navigating. Every That was a part of my, you know, tangled web that I've woven. It was a little bit of social anxiety. I have a little bit of social awkwardness just because I exist on a different time scale than most human beings. So some people, you know, my the friends from the dispensary, the, you know, the friends from, from Champagne, people are typically starting their night at seven or eight. I'm going to bed at seven or eight. So it just doesn't really line up all the time. And I would kind of get down on myself about that. I'd be, you know, oh, you know, I just, I'm never, I'm never going to fit in. You know, I'm going to be the socially awkward. So that's when you redirect. That's when you bring it back to the practice. That's when you tell yourself a mantra or the voice of power steps in and says, Ernest. And then this is my voice of power. <laughs> but what the fuck are you doing? But this doesn't benefit you. Let's get back. You know, let's, let's get back to feeling good. You can do something right now if you want to or not want to. But let's just get your, your point of attentions back on track. Let's get everything back on track and then reevaluate and reassess. So some of those behavioral things, they're slowly starting to loosen themselves out. It's a little bit easier now for me to attend these social events that I agree to, or I don't agree <laughs> because I know that I may not want to when the time comes. I don't want to make plans two weeks in advance because when it comes two weeks have elapsed, maybe I don't feel like it. You know, maybe today's just my day to, I don't want to do shit. So I'm not going to back out because I never agreed to it. <laughs> So I'm being more cognizant, more mindful of when I agree to things. So these things all just start to, to kind of iron themselves out on their own as long as we're not indulging this erroneous time scale. Does that make sense? Yeah, just say maybe. And I do that now. And, I, and I'm also upfront with people. So if Gene is like, Ernest, you know, that's you know, make this plan. And I'm like, okay, but, <laughs> you know, I do want to go with you. I just want you to know, I want to give you a heads up that this is kind of something that I'm, I'm ironing out. You know, I'm still, still working on this. So if the time comes, I just want you to know that I may or may not attend. <laughs> and it's not really making excuses. It's not really setting myself up for anything. It's just being honest. I'm just communicating and just letting Gene know that, 
history would say that I'm not very good at, at making and meeting my plans. But it's something that I'm definitely ironing out. I don't like working on. I don't like, I don't like creating the multiplicity of self, former earnest, shadow earnest, future. No, there is just this. And some of these things are, are slowly like sheets that are you put out in the wind to dry. Those wrinkles will just fall out in the wind from the movement. And I can give you tons of examples, but that kind of puts myself on blast. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to give you an example there because I had okay. sent you a message about this. Um, remember the time that I went on the gel celery juice and was determined to buy celery and juice it every single day for about three months. And I was so strict with myself and I'd had this every morning. The fridge was full of celery. You know, this was, it was like a production line in my kitchen making this juice. And I kind of wrecked the lining of my stomach by, of course, uh, it wasn't just celery. Then I decided to add fresh ginger and lemon juice and apples and spinach and, I started to get this awful uh, um, acid reflux, which never really went away. I am still dealing with it a bit. So I had to step out of that and say, this is not working. This is not good for me. I feel bad, but it took me a long time because I'm doggedly determined and I don't give up on things easily. That is part of my nature. Well, it can be moved, but so uh, recently then I started to go walking every day. And this is for about a year I've been doing this, going walking. And then I got a new phone and it had mapped my walk on it. So I started to walk and uh, do the miles and look at it every day and put a picture on. I was really enjoying this, um, seeing the miles increasing every single day. But my feet were getting sore and sore, the top of my feet, the tendons in the top of my feet. But I ignored it and walked on and walked on. And then the realization hit me when I couldn't really, there was days that I couldn't even hardly put the training shoes on because the, the laces were hurting the top of my feet. And I thought, I'm going to have to take a week off. And then the penny dropped. It was just the same situation in different clothes. You know, I thought I wasn't beating myself up about it, but I had one moment of, oh my God, here I am again doing the same thing. But that was the point where the practice kicked in and I said, right, okay, I need to stop. I need to reevaluate. I still want to walk. I want to continue walking, but I'm going to stop for a week and let this heal. So I had to ice my feet every week. I had swollen tendons on the top of my feet. I was up to 20 miles a week. I was so proud of myself. I was really impressed. But uh, I had to stop. And I was icing my feet every week and I went out and bought myself a pair of like walking boots, nice, really supportive, quite expensive, but I don't really buy much. So it was a good buy. And that was the point. And I've started to walk again gradually 20 minutes every day, which is just about a mile and sometimes two miles. But my feet have really improved. And I found an exercise online where you can rotate your feet. And I've made all kinds of improvements that way, but I'm just getting back slowly. But the pattern was there from before the celery juice. It was just the celery juice all over again. You know, they taken it to extremes. There wasn't balance in it. Um, but the practice saved me this time because I knew what to do. Not to feel like a failure because it wasn't a fail. It was a week off. And I'm back to uh, <laughs> doing it a different way, but with more balance. Right. No, that is a perfect example. I'm going to refill my coffee while Shaney gets the dogs ready because Neo's very vocal about his walk. So give me just a second, okay? Be right back. All right. Yeah, Ida, I think that is a really good example. And I knew that when we started this group study, we would eventually start to get to some of the topics that I didn't touch on as much in the past. 
just because it wasn't quite ironed out like how I would deliver it. But while I agree with Donna to, you know, when we talk about that there is no like blueprint for every single human being, right? The systems that I have created, they're in layers, layers that never go away, phases, not steps and things like that. But <laughs> there's that but, Mike. <laughs> However, uh, that's where my mind can be tricky too. It's good to stay in the moment, being aware and going with the flow and your feeling, body, et cetera. Yep, rather than the mind goal in the moment, right. So there's two things that, that will really benefit. Oh, yes, did you, did you have something to add? Go ahead. I thought I saw a, a mic on mic. Did you yeah. hear me? I said, does that make sense? Where the mind could be tricky too. It's like I have this goal and I'm gonna get it done. I'm doing good, but my body's hurting like hell, so. What I'm learning to do is be aware, too, with the points of attention, and then rather than to the force with the mind, to accept, be aware, and go with the flow. My body's hurting right now. That's my goal, but maybe I'll walk tomorrow because right now I'm not feeling too good. Does that matter where the mind can trick you and say, you're being bad, you didn't do your goal, but you're, you're taking care of yourself because your body's hurting. Exactly. And that would be the leaking power. So the moment that we say, oh, you know, we should be doing this. We, we said that we were going to do this. You have to do this. That is a form of leaking power. We're getting down on ourselves. And the dynamic, the, the way that things move, you know, the principle behind this is that we, we don't need to use force. It is a matter of intention and will. And as long as we don't leak power, we gain momentum. That's it. That's the principle. So we don't have to beat ourselves up when something doesn't go the way that we want it to or the way that we planned it to. Does that make sense? So here's kind of how it works. Before we can get into behavioral mindfulness, we ha I, I really believe that the cognitive attention and the cognitive mindfulness must be there. Because we have to be aware of the thoughts that are either talking us in and out of these different behaviors. And then also the leaking power. We have to be aware of that. Otherwise, there's no point. Like what we're doing will not have the same effect if we're just constantly leaking power all over the place. It will be up and down. It will be left and right. It will be like you see on Facebook where somebody is, you know, this high flying, I'm, you know, going to coach everybody to enlightenment. And then two or three months down the road, or maybe even less, you know, they themselves are, are hitting rock bottom. And then, of course, what happens after rock bottom? There's a little bit of that uptick. And now we're back. And it's like, yes, I get everything. And then, no, 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 no we're back down. So it's, it's just really this up and down effect. Again, if that's occurring, it's occurring. Let's work with it. Let's learn with it. Let's but it is not necessary. I do not have to break down to break through. I need to clear my mind and let the energy flow and breakthrough is constant. Aha, aha, aha. I don't have to hit rock, rock and bottom to have an aha moment. Now, I describe in the voice of power why that occurs, though. But that's a dynamic that is not the most energy efficient. So no thanks. I'm not really interested in chaos theory to, to the point where you know, I, I drive myself to near insanity so that I have that exaltation moment. And then there's the inspiring thought. That does work, but there is another way. So if the cognitive mindfulness is there, and again, and I do agree with Donna, everybody's going to be a little bit different, but I do believe these need to be in order. They need to be there. So first is the cognitive attention. Well, with cognitive attention comes cognitive mindfulness. Gene, what do I mean by cognitive mind? And we're talking about thought when I say cognition, thinking. What is thinking mindfulness? What does that even mean? Uh, observing where you are at any one point in time, observing where your mind went and what it's doing. And the key is without judgment, 
without creating these opinions about what you're thinking, why you're thinking, because if you do, that could definitely start to lend to leaking power, right? Okay, so now we have cognitive attention. We have cognitive mindfulness to where now we see our thoughts and it's like, it's okay. This isn't serving me, so I'm going to redirect it, but it is okay. And again, when I say okay, that's not a form of acceptance and then, you know, we're not going to do anything about it. I hear that so many times. Anger is okay. Well, now let's look at this. If you are angry and it has occurred, it's occurred. What can you do? It's occurred. So let's redirect. Let's get back into our practice. But it's not okay to the point that I'm going to accept my anger. I'm also not going to reject it and use force. I'm going to go back to my practice where anger has no room to exist. And eventually it will start to dissolve. It will start to give way to emotions that are a little less strong, a little less strong, a little less strong. And then I can, you know, get back in a direction that's beneficial to me. If somebody, you know, beat up somebody that I really like, I might get angry. I do not accept that anger as productive, but I'm also not going to reject it and get down on myself because it's occurred, right? So there's a difference. When I say it's okay, I do not mean that this is something that I am just going to accept as a dynamic of being human. That isn't, I do not see the accuracy in that. Well, we're only human. We're going to get mad. We're going to hate. It's only human to hate. No, it is not. It is a part of the dysfunction that we have created as individuals. And if it's there, it's there. And we can learn to unravel that and let the wrinkles loosen and, and fall out. So if you find yourself angry, accept it because it's occurring now. That's what I mean. But also redirect it so that it doesn't continue to gain momentum. I love that, Ernest, because I just went through that. And you're right. What? I didn't expect it, but my coworker was behaving a certain way and it was making me angry. I didn't care for the way she was treating me. But my intention was not to be angry because I realized I will carry that toxicity if I continue like projecting hate. But I accepted, yeah, I don't like it. And I was aware that I liked my perception better than hers. <laughs> so I had to say, we all have our perceptions. I may not care for the way she's behaving, but my intention is to be filled with um, respect and loving care for the children I'm taking care of. And what happened was the anger stayed, but then it totally dissipated because I saw a larger view of, I don't want to be in this toxicity, even if they're talking about me or sending hate at me, I don't want to play. And it just dissolved, and I didn't expect that. So I do see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. That's a good example. And that's a good, a good life example in the island of the practical, because we all, well, most of us, Donna, most of us have jobs and have to work. <laughs> She's retired. So. so let's look at this. So we have, and now, so this is the three, the three aspects to the, di to the dynamic. And oddly, I don't have a name for this yet. I usually have a name for everything, but so it starts as cognitive attention. I have to be present and I have to look at my thoughts. Second is cognitive mindfulness. I need to look at my thoughts, but not get down on myself, not judge it. Be prepared to redirect it, though, if it's not serving me. Passivity is not a beneficial thing. If somebody's punching you in the face, I don't recommend passivity. You don't have to get angry. You could just move. You could bob. You could weave. You could run. You could, you know, yell help. There's so many things other than letting somebody punch me in the face. So the third aspect that emerges is cognitive intelligence. Now, I have the word knowledge. Knowledge has three parts. Knowledge leads to wisdom. Wisdom is acting on what you've learned. Intelligence is our connection to the fabric of the cosmos. Let's say that Gene is introduced to a puzzle he has never seen in his life. He has no idea what this thing is. He doesn't know how it works. He just knows it's a puzzle and he has something to figure out. If he is relaxed, if the energy is flowing, if he is in flow, 
he will figure it out quicker than if he wasn't. If he was angry, if he was frustrated, if he was egotistical, and he's like, oh, this is just a stupid puzzle. I can do this quick. You know, thinking these thoughts, mm -mm. the energy is not going to flow. And he may still solve the puzzle. Number one, it wasn't the most efficient. And number two, he probably didn't do it as quickly. Does that make sense? So the intelligence, the way that I use the word, doesn't really have anything to do with information. Doesn't really have anything to do with knowledge. Doesn't necessarily have anything to do with wisdom either. It may be a situation, a circumstance that he has never seen before, but yet can still navigate it with flow because of the, the intelligent nature. We see this intel intelligence in nature itself, like birds and you know, all life on earth has a form of intelligence. Does that make sense? Some life more than others can display this intelligence. I will say that. But I'm not prepared to say that just because I don't understand algae that it's not intelligent. It may have some sort of thing that I'm just not able to perceive. So I'm in the camp that everything is connected. Therefore, intelligence can flow through it. That's why it's alive in the first place. That's why it has evolved because there's this innate intelligence. And again, intelligence isn't words. It, it's often translated in our minds, though, quickly into words, because that's what we do. But in itself, it's just our connection to everything flowing through us, universal intelligence. Does that make sense? Uh, wisdom and intelligence kind of overlap. I, I, I don't really see a clear distinction. Mm -hmm. Well, wisdom is coming from the knowledge. So the wisdom and, and in intelligence could look like wisdom, but if you had no prior knowledge, no prior experience, then you're not really expressing what you know, you're what you've learned, right? So we use that hot pan example. So you have the information that when something is read, and it's metal, it could be hot. You've read that in a book somewhere. But Ernest also told you that once upon a time, he touched a red hot handle and it, and it was hot and it burned me. And then once upon a time, you started to get close to that handle, you felt the heat and you're like, whoa, it's all true. Well, you just applied your knowledge unto wisdom. Let's say you didn't have any prior information whatsoever. Nobody has ever told you anything about heat. Babies do this sometimes. Sometimes babies, it's just like, how did you know to do or not to do? And then sometimes, maybe not. <laughs> so the distinction is subtle, but the distinction is important because that's the inner guru sometimes. It's being translated as words like, you know, maybe I don't need to do this. That's a form of intelligence, you know? And the distinction isn't necessary. Like we don't have to dissect it and say, oh, is this wisdom or is this intelligence? So, but the way the dynamic works is that if we're paying attention to our minds, and this is just cognitive, it's gonna to lead to two other types of attention. But if I'm, that's coming next, Donna. So first, we're aware of our thoughts. We're not gonna judge our thoughts because we're mindful and then all of a sudden that leaves room for universal intelligence flow and also applying unto wisdom because we're not, we're not like interfering with that flow. So we will more than likely apply our knowledge unto wisdom and then apply our intelligence unto knowledge and then unto wisdom, right? So, and I do believe that this should go in order most often. The next would be emotional mindfulness. But first, we need emotional attention. You have to learn to pay attention to how you feel. Somebody is saying, I, you know, feel the, you're always feeling feels. Like you are an emotional being. Everybody listening to this has never had a second in their life where they did not have some sort of electrochemical, physiological, electrochemical thing happening. Uh, release your need to control so the mysterious action of the universe can accelerate. I like it, but I wouldn't want to use the word mysterious, but I like it. <laughs> I'm so critical. I know. <sighs> it's just for... Interject something here because I'm dying. Yes, Do Donna, don't die. Yes, interject. <laughs> 
I think that the feeling, I know that you have an order in, in, in the way that you present it. And that's great because it's the way that I understood it. And it's the way that I got to, it helped me get to the point that I'm at now. But I think that when you talk about the baby, I think every example that every, everybody gave, that Ida gave, that Eugene gave, that um, uh, Jerry gave, all had to do with feeling. Uh, Jerry was pissed off at the woman about the way she was treating her and she didn't logically dissect it until after she had a feeling, a feeling like, hey, I don't like the way this person is treating me. Hey, why am I having such an extreme feeling about this? Okay, now I'm gonna look at this differently. Um, Ida had a feeling in her feet. They were killing her. <laughs> so it, she got to the point where she had this feeling in her feet and she said, oh, I have to look at this differently. Jean had a feeling of, holy shit, I forgot again. It was only been 20 minutes. Like this sucks. Like I'm not doing this right. There was a feeling that made him have those words in his head. Maybe the words in his head were habitual and repetitive. Maybe Ida's uh, going to extremes was habitual habitual and repetitive. Maybe Jerry's feeling of, I don't like the way this person is treating me has a history. I don't know. I, I don't live inside any of them, but it seems like that from their examples. And even the baby, when a baby's hungry or a baby gets stuck by a diaper pin, oh, I know they don't use pins anymore, but um, it screams and cries, cause it hurt. When you touch the hot pan, it hurts. So it's all the thinking that we interject over the feeling that sometimes sometimes gets us down a rabbit hole. And if we could simplify it, this works for me, it took a really long time to figure this out. I only have two choices. I have a feeling, I notice this feeling. I don't feel good anymore. When I was la 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 in flow and alignment, whether I was focused on my breath or the shadows or my feet, or I was coasting from a feeling that I used 20 minutes ago and I stopped and I forgot about it, but I'm still coasting and something changed. It's a feeling that I notice first. It's a feeling that happens first before the thoughts or maybe the thoughts were happening and it evoked a feeling. Um, but, but the feeling is what gets my awareness fastest. Mm -hmm. You did, you and did. Yes. I'm I understand sorry. what you're saying. There was an order of operations here. I get it. The yeah. principles don't change, even though it's different for me, the way I go about it, different, which is different than Jean's, than Ida's, than Jerry's, than yours. Um, you will tend to break it down in words and, and examine it. And I'll go, oh, I don't know how I feel, you know, like that's the first place I go to. I want to feel happy, la la la. I want to feel like a little kid. I want to feel like, woo wee. I want to feel like, ooh, this is new and exciting. And I don't feel like that right now. The thing I need to learn was not to project it outward. I can't change anything in my environment. The only thing I can change is the direction of my mind. So that's that's the connection I had to make. Then I go to your, your thinking, which is I can either change the way I look at this or I can change what I'm doing. So if I'm in a if I'm in a work setting and someone is pissing me off, if we use um, Jerry's example, I can't really just walk out of work. So changing the way I look at it, oh, well, she has her perspective. I have my perspective, but that's what she did. She, she changed the way she looked at it so that she could feel differently about it. Um, you know, you can't not beat yourself up. You have to do something else. So Ida, um, decided that she was going to use a technique called, I walked yesterday and that was walking and that's plenty. I has, still have momentum going. She chose to um, look at it in a different way. I was thinking, Ida, by the way, while you were talking, athletes visualize their run, they visualize their race, they visualize throwing the bowling ball, um, which helps them. They say that if they were electromagnetically wired up, the body goes through the same reactions as it does if they were actually doing the event. So if, imagining the walk while you were icing your feet might've been a, a good technique instead of having to hustle yourself and convince it of something else. But anyway, I just want to throw that in there. Uh, for me, what has really, really helped me is I like to feel good and I can easily feel, I don't feel guilty or selfish about wanting to feel good because all I'm doing is changing the direction of my mind 
and that doesn't really affect anybody else. So I don't have to go through all the guilty crap. Mm -hmm. um, so I will, I guess it's it, um, cognitive intelligence that everybody used. Jerry used it to get to a better place. Mm -hmm. Peter used it to get to a better place. Um, but the but the consistent thing between all those examples was the feeling we are human beings. We live in a human body and everything we think has a feeling associated with it. Um, whether we're uh, allowing it to come in or we're creating it by deliberate modulation, which is my new newest favorite thing to do all the time. Um, I can get myself to feel in that happy place, no matter what's going on, pretty much. As soon as I notice I feel myself crappy, I'm looking for a deliberate modulation, different perspective to feel good again. And then I'm right back on track and I'm right back in the ball game. And then I remember what was my points of attention that I chose this morning? What was my, I don't go searching for them with thinking because if I think about it too much, then I get lost in thinking. I get lost in thinking really easily and it feels worse and worse. So it's for me, the feeling comes first. I wanna feel like this. What am I gonna do to feel like that first? And then I remember all the study stuff that we've done and I'm back on track. So I just wanted to interject the feeling because it's always well, yeah. there. It is always there. And then so the three things that I was going to you know, describe is the cognitive attention, the emotional, which is feeling. So we keep using the word feeling. I use the word emotion. It's all emotion. It's all emotional. And then that leads to the behavioral. So it's those three things. The reason I do cognitive first is because the vast majority of emotion is coming from a mood. The mood and the emotion, they feed off of each other. And then they, they basically, that's where the source of some of the thought is, is from the emotion and from the mood. And then the thought perpetuates the emotion and perpetuates Absolutely. the mood. They're almost inextricably tied. They are inextricably they are. tied. They but are. For, and the only you, for you and maybe Gene, perhaps, because I know him best of anybody in the group, is that the cognitive um, dissection of that is the lowest hanging fruit. For me, the feeling is the lowest hanging fruit. So, right. So, yeah. no, I, I get what you're saying, but for, no, for me, that's not true. So, I feel. I am like, that's, that's one of the most fundamental things about the way that I interact with the world is it's, it's all a feeling, right? So, but the only reason I'm doing this in an order is because if we can first learn to observe our thoughts and be mindful of our thoughts, so much of the emotion will be taken care of in just that act. But if, if we're not used to paying attention to our own thought, what are we gonna do with that emotion besides use thought to get down on ourselves? So it doesn't have to be in any one order and they arrive simultaneously most often. But I am a, a feeling like everything is felt. So um, it has nothing really to do with me for like lowest hanging fruit. It's just the delivery and the order of operations to help move somebody out of psychological suffering. The thought has been driving their psychological suffering. And when I say psychological suffering, I'm talking about emotional suffering. We're suffering emotionally because of our psychology, because of the way that we're thinking. So it makes sense to start with the root. The root of the suffering is the way that we're interacting with our own thoughts, the way that the voice of not power is occurring. Right. And then so yeah. that is, has been driving these emotional states for so long. Yeah, Shana. Yeah, I agree. Because most of the time before it was like I was reacting to situations rather than you know, taking it in and then listening instead of, instead I was reacting and then it was causing all this emotion in my body. So yeah, it was a lot of the thoughts because I'm like, why are they doing this to me? I don't understand why they're coming at me like that. Yeah. Yeah, and I then, get it. But the reaction was a emotional. Feeling. It was, yeah. and we're not denying that Donna. So, but usually it was directed by the thought that I was having exactly. about why this person is coming at me like that. Cause I don't Bingo. deserve to be talked like to like that. They shouldn't be talking to me like that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And then okay, when we talk right. about, and then Ida, when we talk about like not doing the things that we want, it's, we're usually talking ourselves in and out of it. So it just makes sense to, at least in the delivery of the system, you know, how somebody picks it up and runs with it will be different. Sure. But we must start with the root. 
the source is the way that we're thinking. And it's that thinking that's leading to the behavior and the emotion. That is the root core. So it just makes sense to start with the root core. But that can lead quickly into, here we go again, emotional attention, keeping an eye on your own emotional state. But how can you have emotional mindfulness, which is not judging the emotion, if we first didn't establish cognitive mindfulness? Because that's what mindfulness is. Not judging is an opinion. It's a stream of thought. It's words. So if I never introduced to Gene cognitive attention and cognitive mindfulness, if he starts paying attention to his emotions, he's going to start judging the shit out of himself. He's going to be like, oh, this is terrible, and I can't believe I feel like this, and why do I, I'm such a, you know, this, that, or the other thing. You cannot have the emotional mindfulness, which is not generating an opinionated thought about your emotion. That won't exist without cognitive mindfulness, which is the thought. I'm paying attention to my own thoughts, but I'm not judging my thoughts. And then intelligently, I can redirect my thoughts. Let's go to emotion. I'm now aware of my emotion because I'm paying attention, but I'm not going to judge my emotion with words in my mind because I'm, I've been practicing my mindfulness. And now that can lead to emotional intelligence, which is I know how I feel. I know how to modulate my emotion. Deliberate modulation is emotional, mind, emotional intelligence. We learn how to go in and out of emotions that we see fit. And that has to do with another phrase that I use called emotional memory. It's not just a delivery system. It's how we have to work with this. Because if we're not mindful, if we haven't created cognitive mindfulness, I bet 10 out of 10 people, if they start to look at their emotions, are going to judge it. They're going to think thoughts about their emotions, and that can become wildly unbeneficial. All of the examples that were given today are all by people who have cognitive attention training, cognitive mindfulness training, and cognitive intelligence. So then all of the emotion is easier to work with, and then, drum roll please, behavior. We can have behavioral attention to where we're observing our behavior as it's occurring. Behavioral mindfulness. We will not judge the behavior, good, bad, plus, minus, maybe beneficial or unbeneficial, so that we can behavioral intelligence redirect. Redirect yeah. our behavior, redirect our emotion, because we're able to redirect our thoughts. And the person has to have somewhat of awareness that their thoughts are causing that emotion or that feeling. If there's not that awareness, it's just going to continue happening over and over again. Exactly. And if they don't know how to work with their own voice in their mind, I don't care how much you pay attention to your emotions. You're probably going to drive them in one direction or the other. And that's a, that's a, a form of force, manipulation, control, or just unconscious derivative. But so Jerry highlighted the second factor of embodiment, which is where does suffering come from? Psychological suffering come from thought, the way that we think to ourselves, the words going through our mind, which is why The Voice of Power is such an important book in the beginning. And that's why I wanted to start with that one, even though I have dream walking finished, even though I have uh, visions of power almost finished. I wanted to start with The Voice of Power because it's, it's that voice, it's the way that we talk to ourselves that drives the emotion and drives the behavior. So first we start with the thought, and then we look at our emotion, and then we can look at our behaviors. I believe that if you go out of order, you may end up in, in who knows what kind of extreme. Now all of a sudden, Gene is in a Buddhist monastery, he has shaved his head, and he has taken a dedication to, you know, whatever. <laughs> And and then he's just going from one type of thinking to another type of thinking, thinking that the new thinking is somehow better thinking. And we all know that that's a broken dynamic. But now let's look at it in the practice. Donna has been practicing for, you know, you were practicing in some form way before we started to collaborate. But in terms of tea, in terms of mindfulness, holding mindfulness, You've been doing this for four or five years. So you're giving an example of somebody who has been practicing, who knows their place in thought, knows what thought is doing in their life experience. And so for you, it's not so much about you know paying attention to your thought first. It's paying attention to how you feel first. And I do the exact same thing. 
I don't have a lot of words going through my mind when I don't want to. So what else am I going to pay attention to? My emotions, my behaviors. And so behavioral mindfulness is I just threw the, the towel on the bed. Wait a second. How does that make me feel when Shana lectures me about the towel on the bed? How does it make me feel when I continuously forget something or remember something and then just don't do it? So eventually, yes, Donna, everything is about that feeling and how it's making you feel, and that can become your guidepost. But for so many people, they are in a wild amount of emotional turmoil that is bottom line being projected. It's being fueled by the way that they're thinking. So the order of operations is not arbitrary. You know, it's there for a very specific reason, although everybody can be a little bit different. You know, we can all come into this practice in different stages of life experience. And yeah, maybe that emotional mindfulness is the lowest hanging fruit. Maybe the behavioral mindfulness is. That seems to be the one that people struggle with the most is redirecting behavior that no longer serves them. And I can understand, especially if the thought if the mindfulness of our thoughts isn't there, now we're just probably going to end up using force and trying to manipulate and control our behaviors. And Ida, we know all about that, right? We know about trying to manipulate and force behavior. It's, it's, it's not a very efficient dynamic. Does that make sense? And so I think the thing that we can talk about more and more is the behavioral mindfulness. Because now we understand what mindfulness is. Gene now understands because we've been talking about the thought and not judging with thought. When he, when he performs a behavior, maybe he tells a lie. It's a little white lie, and then, but he feels that. You know, you, you feel that little white lie, and you're like, wait a second. I, I don't like that feeling. So I don't want to tell this lie. Then again, I might not tell the whole truth. I might just redirect and start talking about something totally different because I don't want to go down that road. But how he acts after he's paid attention to the behavior, he didn't judge the behavior as good or bad. It's not like, oh, here I go again lying. I'm such a liar. You know, everybody tells white lies. Bullshit. Where, where is that? Like, that makes no sense. It's only human to tell lies every now and then when you really need to. Bullshit. It's an attachment to the construct of self. That's why you're lying. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, really good discussion. And I think Donna really points on important aspects of the practice, especially once we've been doing it for a while. Because eventually... When we're creating space, if you're not thinking, you're feeling. You're feeling everything. You're feeling the lighting. You're feeling the shadows. Now we're going to start to get into dream walking because now we're feeling our body in space and time. We're feeling the essence of the moment. We're feeling what it's like to be human, what it's like to live in the third largest city in the grand empire of the United States. You know, I say that just because I'm. I wonder if people in ancient Rome thought that way. Like, here we are in, in Rome, which will someday be ancient Rome. Here we are in the United States, which will someday be the ancient United States. And when you're like feeling into your body, especially, you immediately know when things are out, out of place. Like when a thought pops up and then all of a sudden your body feels it. And then you go back to whatever trick of tension, a different trick of tension to, to help, you know, some type of mind, you know, a mantra of, of some sort to, to help release that, that feeling that you're feeling because you're reacting in a habitual manner, of course, to a situation that's occurred many times. It takes a lot of practice to, to understand hey, these thoughts are coming in because I'm used to feeling that way. <laughs> this is how I react to situations. And then once you recognize the feeling initially, you can go right back into your practice and it helps dissolve that initial reaction away um, and brings you back to center. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dana, and, but even more so, that's right on. That's right on what, for me. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, but but even more so, I have always been the kind of person that um, 
when I'm um, <clears throat> I'm not aligned, it translates to physical pain uh, or illness in some way very quickly. And then there's the, all the overthinking about the diagnosis or the thing or what did I eat or you know how, what did I lift or you know um, or I'm I'm reading. Louise Hay, and I'm saying oh, lower back pain means I'm worried about money and knee pain means I'm worried about moving into the future. And all those things were helpful, but, but um, now I find it a gift because if I'm hurting in some way or my body is bothering me in some way or my shoulders are up in my ears, I go, oh, where, where's my mind? Yes, I know I'm the same. I, I know directly yeah. it's because of what I've been thinking or what I've been allowing my, I haven't been paying attention. I haven't been in practice and it translates to my body so fast. Yep, me too. Yep, I, I tense up. So it's a, it's a, it's an alert system. I think Kim just wrote that. Somebody wrote that somewhere in the chat, but yeah, it's an alert system. Mm -hmm. Well, and then we're emotional creatures. Like every, we're always experiencing an emotion. So, and then here's another reason for the order of operations is because if I have the cognitive attention and, and, you know, the three intelligence, and then I have some emotional intelligence, when I go to do a behavior, what am I going to tie that behavior to? How it makes me feel. And then how I feel, and then it goes back to the thought. So there's so many examples. When I was working at the dispensary just recently, I decided that I wasn't really interested in promotion. Well, does that mean I stop working? Does that mean I stop giving my best effort? Does that mean I stop doing all of the meticulous things that I do? No, because I don't like the feeling of being lazy. I don't like the feeling of not giving my best effort. I don't like the feeling of stealing time from a company. I don't like those feelings of lying to somebody about something stupid and simple. It just it doesn't feel good because I'm so used to paying attention to my emotions and then I'm so used to understanding where those emotions come from, which is thought. So if we have these three in place, and I do believe if they're in order, it will be easier for somebody to manage. If they skip steps yeah. and just go to behavior, I really I think agree. that they're, yeah. I was just gonna add like, when your mind is relaxed and that person calls you angry, you, you're not reacting because you're not thinking thoughts about yourself and how they're talking to you. So then those feelings don't occur in your body. You just feel peace when you're, you're just, they're yelling at you and you're able to, you know, have that discussion with that person a little better. You, and you recognize that maybe they're not, they're not going to be able to hear what you're saying. So you just listen to what they're saying. And, you know, there's, sometimes there's just nothing you can do because they they have moved out to a different realm of anger and you're in peace and you guys aren't aligning. So yeah, when you're in peace, you're not going to feel that feeling because you, your thoughts and your, your thoughts aren't going into self and about me and why am I being treated like this? Exactly. And if we were to start recognizing peace or no peace, and what Which can is, I do about right. that? You can't change them. So it's my right. perception that's causing my own suffering. So yes. easy. And I don't even have to talk those words anymore. It's like, ouch, no way. Back to the practice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really yeah, and then, not a lot of words. And then like most things, Donna, the thought or the cognition, the emotion and the behavior are happening simultaneously. We, we, we can't really separate them in our experience per se, but we can separate them to work with them. All right, great group study. I, w I did record and I will post it to YouTube so that we can rewatch, um, but I do have to get going because I have to leave at eight to get to work. Um, but yeah, any other questions, comment, send them to me. But, you know, throughout the group study, when we have been progressing together, the behavior stuff, that was always a little bit tricky because I don't like manipulating, I don't like controlling, and I don't like telling people what to do. But now it's more deliverable because we've all been working together long enough that we can understand that first. And, 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 and again, you know, the division, we divide it, 
And then before you know it, the more we practice, it all starts to come back together at the same time, right? So Donna, I personally don't have these things separate. I feel it, I, my behavior is there, my thought, it's all occurring at once. But I did separate it so that I could break it down and work with it. So we've talked a lot about mindfulness, our thoughts, we have started to touch on emotions. You know, I'm going to talk about emotions even more. I'm not going to use the word vibration. I'm not going to use the word. They work. They're fine. But let's just use the word emotion. Feeling. What are we feeling? What are we perceiving? Emotion. And that's what we're feeling. That's what we're perceiving. Electrochemical, physiological, hormonal response. It's happening all the time. The moment you wake up, even when you're asleep, this is always occurring. And if we can get those two things in alignment, behavior is going to come as well. If you try to skip steps, you're probably going to be using force, manipulation, control, and you're going to get down on yourself around the behavior. Or you're going to go from one extreme to the other, and then you're drinking celery juice for three months every single day. Right? Or you're going to the city of 10,000 Buddhas, and you come back to your barbecue restaurant, and you say, Ernest, I don't want to handle meat anymore. And you're like, wait, what? <laughs> you own a barbecue restaurant and you don't want to eat meat anymore. That's my long example. <laughs> not eat, not touch. He didn't want to interact with it. And I'm like, how the hell do you have a barbecue restaurant and not interact with meat? What, are you just going to make the coleslaw all day? All right. Well, I will see you guys again on Tuesday. Tuesday, I have my live podcast. And then again on Thursday, we'll do the group study. And website's moving along, book is moving along, I'll have advanced copies and signed copies. And I don't think that this is necessarily my masterpiece, but it's good. It's, it's, it's a story, it tells like a story, two-person dialogue, it has a, a, a point, and it has a, a rise of action and, and all of that kind of fun stuff. So I do think that it will continue to improve and get better and better and better, you know. But I do think this is the best I've written so far. So I really am excited for you all to read it, and I'm excited to talk about it. And while I think the voice of power is good, this group is going to love Visions of Power. I just know it. I know that this is the book that Ida has been waiting for, is Visions of Power and Dreamwalking. But that will be after a few months at least of, of uh, the voice of power. There is a lot of magic in visions of power. Yeah, you've painted a lot of that magic, I think, <laughs> Ida. You see, right. the word, I was just going to say about the word magic, magical. It's a bit like the way I feel about that word is a bit like trying to describe spirit. Mm -hmm. It's the same sort of feeling that I have about it. You know, when you see magical plastered all over Facebook, magical, magical, yeah. it's not the way I feel about it. I think it's subtler than that. Well, I think we're in agreement because it's a word that I have embraced. Because when I look at the world from that dreamwalking state, from that artist's perspective, where you're not judging it, you're not labeling it, you're just observing it from a, a different viewpoint like Shana's picture right there in her in her little profile. That's a perspective. To get the camera down there, to view the world from that direction, it creates a magical feeling. That's, the, that's what I'm talking about when I use the word magic. It's that feeling of looking at the world from the artist's perspective. Remember, an artist can look at some of the most ugly, I'm putting that in air quotes, things. Like when Shana and I went to the, the art fair and they showed abandoned buildings, People would walk by those buildings and not even look at it, but the way that the artist captured it, mm, that's magic. It's dreamy. That's why I use the term dreamwalking, because it's the same feeling that I have when I'm aware in my dreams. It's magical. But the moment you start judging and you start labeling, comparing, contrasting, that feeling is gone. All right. Well, I will see you guys again on Tuesday, and I hope you have a great rest of your weekend. I have a three-day weekend, so I'm going to have some fun tomorrow, probably. Saturday is my doctor's appointment, so that won't be as fun, but that's okay. Yeah. I'll tell you all about my practice going into the doctor's Saturday. office. <laughs> yes. What did you say, Donna? Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> and I'll see you guys on Tuesday. Have a good rest of your week.
Thank you. Bye, everyone. You're welcome.